It's another busy day of news with two major stories we're following this morning. One of them in Washington, where history is unfolding. Day two of Supreme Court confirmation hearings about to get underway in the Senate this morning for Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. If confirmed, she would be the first black woman to serve on the Supreme Court. Thank you for this historic chance to join the highest court, to work with brilliant colleagues, to inspire future generations, and to ensure liberty and justice for all. But President Biden's nominee faces opposition from Republicans who are promising pointed questions for Jackson today, particularly her record on criminal cases. We have full coverage of what we can expect today coming up in just a few minutes. The other major story we're following this morning is the war in Ukraine. This morning, several key cities bombed beyond recognition with President Biden warning that Russia could soon escalate its assault with chemical weapons. Russian forces are inching closer to the center of the country's capital, Kyiv, but Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says his country will fight till the end. And Ukraine's armed forces say they've reclaimed control of a city 30 miles west of the capital. All this as the refugee crisis grows. The UN now says more than three and a half million people have been forced from their homes, most of them women and children. The most traumatic question I had from my kid is why Russians try to kill us. And I really don't understand why they want to kill us. We have team coverage this morning. Military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs will help us take a closer look at Russia's military progress and the Ukrainian resistance. But we're going to start in Ukraine with NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter in the western city of Volovets. Molly, good to have you with us. Let's start with the humanitarian effort. Ukraine says it evacuated a little more than 8,000 people on Monday. That includes about 3,000 from hard-hit Mariupol. What is the situation like over there right now? Joe, good morning. And 3,000, not even close to the numbers that Ukrainian officials are hoping uh, to see come out of that besieged city. There are an estimated 300,000 people still inside. And this, of course, is the southeast city, uh, which has just been besieged, has been starved out by the Russians. Now, the only way out uh, are these evacuation quarters, which have continually failed. But you have to now get in private cars to get to two villages that are just on the outset, uh, on the outskirts of Mariupol. Buses actually can't get in anymore. So you have to go through about 15, 16 checkpoints. Get to those two villages, and Joe, that is where you can get on buses. Go to another city called Berdyansk. It is also on the coast. It is also strategic, becoming increasingly dangerous. That is where people are getting their first uh, load of medical supplies, much-needed food, water. They are then getting on buses and going up to Zaporizhia, Joe. And Zaporizhia is where a big train station is. That is where people are getting on the trains uh, and heading westward to Lviv or to Volovets, where I am. And last week, when those first trains arrived from Zaporizhia with residents of Mariupol, that's when we started to get firsthand accounts from people who had actually survived for the last three weeks, Joe. I want to also ask you about the southern city of Kherson, which has been captured by Russian forces. Yesterday, we saw Russian troops try and disperse Ukrainian protesters who were rallying against the occupation. What more can you tell us about what happened there? Joe, that's right. And this is, like, as you say, the first city that Russians uh, have been able to take over and actually hold and continue to occupy. There were protests out, as there have been many days uh, in recent, in the last couple of weeks. And they came out, Russian forces came out with stun grenades and gunfire in a statement uh, from officials there. They said Russian security forces ran up, started throwing stun grenades into the crowd and shooting. Now, on the video that we have seen and our team has verified, we hear loud bangs uh, and we hear gunfire and we see a lot of civilians unarmed running for cover, Joe. And I also want to ask you about looking forward. We heard last night Ukraine's President Zelensky again calling for a meeting with President Putin, saying that he's open to dropping his country's ambition to join NATO. That's a key Russian demand. So at this point, how likely is a meeting between both leaders, something that will actually perhaps bring Putin to the table? That's exactly right. And this is not the first time President Zelensky has said this or asked for this meeting. We have heard him in many of his late night selfie addresses that he says, Putin and I need to sit down and talk. Now, word is uh, from two FT journalists with sources inside the negotiating room. They say that Mariupol has been a sticking point in the negotiations. Russians obviously see Mariupol as a huge strategic win. But we know the Ukrainians are not backing down, according to defense officials uh, from the U.K. this morning. The Ukrainians are continuing uh, to put up a very good fight. Russia 
Russian uh, forces are not being able to uh, continue to encroach on that city. But as far as what will get Vladimir Putin to the table, Dmitry Peskov is speaking right now in Moscow. We may get some indication after that press conference whether or not anything has changed. But up until now, Joe, we have no indication that Vladimir Putin uh, is serious about getting to the table with President Zelensky. All right. Molly Hunter reporting from Ukraine. Molly, thank you so much. Let's get more on the situation in Ukraine with NBC News military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs. Colonel, good to have you on again. I want to start by asking you about the Ukrainian military's latest operational report. For those unfamiliar, the report claims that Russian forces on the ground have food and ammunition stockpiles that will last no more than just three days. However, the report also says that in the sky, Russia's aviation presence has increased over the past 24 hours. So knowing all that, is it fair to say Russia has had more success in the skies than it has on the ground? Well, it hasn't had very much success on the ground by their own standards. They didn't achieve their objectives. They didn't achieve anything as quickly as they thought they would. And a lot of it has to do with the courage of the Ukrainian people and the, and the uh, anti-tank and anti-aircraft weapons they've received from the West. But the Russians have also suffered from an inability to use their tactical capabilities to the fullest. They tend to stick to the roads. Uh, they're all in vehicles. They're easy to pick off. They don't have security on the flanks or to the front. It is easy for the Russians to resupply uh, on the ground, less easy in the air because they do not have tactical air superiority. There is air parity at best in some areas. And the Ukrainians have ground-to-air anti-aircraft wep weapons that are very, very effective. Uh, but the, the, the Russians are having a great deal of trouble using their tactical advantage, uh, uh, their tactical capability to good advantage. And as long as the Ukrainians continue to harass the Russian formations and take their toll in large numbers of Russian killed and wounded, uh, the stalemate might continue. And then I, I hear you saying that Russia may be struggling. And I know yesterday President Putin, excuse me, President Biden gave one of his strongest warnings yet uh, that Russian President Vladimir Putin may be considering use of chemical or biological weapons. Warning against that. Let's hear what he said. His back is against the wall. And uh, he's, now he's talking about new false flags he's setting up, including... He's asserting that we, America, have biological as well as chemical weapons in Europe. Simply not true. I guarantee you. They're also suggesting that Ukraine has biological and chemical weapons in Ukraine. That's a clear sign he's considering using both of those. So hearing that, do you think it's likely Putin will use these kinds of weapons in Ukraine? And how would that impact the West's response to this conflict, if at all? Well, we don't know if it's likely, but it's certainly possible. <clears throat> don't forget, we have the capability of listening to everything that these people say, both on the ground and in the Kremlin, and we have some idea of what their objectives are, both tactical and strategic. And if you consider the fact that Putin has indiscriminately shelled uh, population areas, is not focused necessarily on Ukrainian forces, but instead... Uh, using artillery, missiles, and other indirect fire to destroy the infrastructure of Ukraine and terrorize the Ukrainian people and kill large numbers of them. If you consider that, then the conclusion that you wouldn't put anything past Putin, including the use of chemical weapons, and as some suggested, small-yield tactical nuclear weapons, you wouldn't put any of that past them. And, Colonel, you've talked a lot about what's happening on the ground. I want to get your take on the diplomatic efforts to end this war. Ukraine has signaled a willingness to meet some of Russia's security demands, including the idea of becoming a neutral country and dropping that bid to join NATO, as we heard again from President Zelensky yesterday. What will it take for Putin to end this conflict? Well, I can't see Putin sitting down to the table with anybody. He doesn't, he doesn't even sit next to any of his advisors, as we saw in that iconic photograph of him sitting at the end of a very long refectory table. Uh, he's not going to sit down with anybody. And the there's been a suggestion that there is a way to have a negotiated settlement. We're probably a long way from that. 
but it would include things that have already happened. That is an assertion by Ukraine that it's not going to join NATO. Uh, but it's also going to include uh, giving up, Ukraine's giving up the eastern provinces and, most importantly, the seacoast on the Black Sea, which Russia desperately wants. But I don't see any of that happening anytime soon. Important analysis. Colonel Jack Jacobs, thanks so much. The flow of refugees into Eastern Europe is showing no signs of slowing down. More than three and a half million Ukrainians have now left their homes for countries in Eastern Europe. And the mass exodus is putting a sizable strain on Poland. That country alone has welcomed more than two million refugees since the war began. For more on the refugee situation, let's go to NBC News senior national correspondent Jay Gray, who joins us now from a town near the Polish border. Jay, good morning. So the town you're in is seeing huge flows of refugees because it serves as a major transportation center that then helps get refugees to other parts of Europe. Walk us through what the situation is like where you're at right now. Yeah, Joe, you're absolutely right. We're in the Prashimish train station, about three miles from the actual border crossing and the first real train station inside Poland if you're coming from western Ukraine. And, and you can see, not packed right now, but that's because uh, people are flowing through in waves. You see families coming through and this area gets full and, and then it'll they'll get on trains or buses and, and head out and, and it drops off again and then uh, runs back through again. But you can see as, as you look along, it gives us kind of a snapshot of, of what happens here. People buying tickets, people uh, consulting with law enforcement here, and, and most important for a lot of people, grabbing a, a hot meal, a, a soup, uh, some water, something uh, that they can have that they haven't had perhaps for uh, two or three days as they've tried to make the journey here. Getting here a lot more difficult. We've talked about that. Uh, we know that right now there are more than seven million people in Ukraine who are homeless. They don't have a home anymore. Many of them don't have a community. It's It's been uh, taken away by what's happened in this war, uh, but they can't get to the border. And, and so that's a real struggle uh, that many are dealing with at this point. But again, they come through here and it's very transient. They, they don't stay very long because they've got to move elsewhere. And as you talked about coming into all this, Joe, Poland, uh, for the most part, when it comes to long-term refugees, is about full. I mean, we've talked with the mayor of Warsaw, who, who says his community, his city, the biggest in Poland, has uh, seen a population rise of 19 percent by refugees alone. So there are 19 percent more people in Warsaw just in refugees that have shown up there. He says all of his city services right now have been dedicated to those refugees and that he's got to find a, a balancing point where he can start to take care of his city again. And, and it's only going to get more difficult because, as the U.N. has said, a lot of those 7 million are expected to head this way, and that number over the next several weeks is expected to grow. Yeah, I mean, Jay, that city alone, Warsaw, has welcomed more than 300,000 Ukrainian refugees since the war broke out. The mayor you're talking about, he yeah. says it's a struggle to help more refugees. So is there anything that's actually being done to try and redirect refugees to other cities or other countries? Or does it seem like many Ukrainians are still heading to the capital? Well, well, I think many are headed that way, but what they've done, not only at the Warsaw train station, but here as well, has made more opportunities for them to get elsewhere. Tickets are paid for, so that's not an issue, but they've added routes going to Germany, going to the Czech Republic. We've seen people flooding in who want to take people to Spain. We've seen organizations coming in saying they'll take people to the Finland, to the UK. And, and so uh, the broader European Union is getting involved here and trying to help. But what Poland's saying is we need to help now, that, that waiting is, is not an option because they know so many more are on the way. Jay Gray continuing to shine a light on the successes and the struggles happening there along the border in Poland. Jay, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. We want to turn now to the other big story we're covering this morning. It is a historic week on Capitol Hill as the Supreme Court confirmation hearings for Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson resume later this morning. Judge Jackson will face a long day of questioning from Senate Judiciary Committee members, putting her one step closer to making history as the first black woman on the Supreme Court. Judge Jackson delivered a powerful and personal opening statement yesterday detailing her long and impressive career while acknowledging the magnitude of this moment. My parents taught me that unlike the many barriers that they had had to face growing up, 
my path was clearer so that if I worked hard and I believed in myself in America, I could do anything or be anything I wanted to be. If I am confirmed, I commit to you that I will work productively to support and defend the Constitution. I know that my role as a judge is a limited one, that the Constitution empowers me only to decide cases and controversies that are properly presented. And I know that my judicial role is further constrained by careful adherence to precedent. The 22 senators on the Judiciary Committee will each have 30 minutes to question Judge Jackson. Joining us now with a preview is NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale. Good morning, Ali. Today will be a very long day. I'm sure you've had your coffee, but first, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I hope you've had your coffee. Uh, but first, set the scene for us. What did Judge Jackson and senators say in their opening statements? Yeah, first of all, my friend, there is never enough coffee, and definitely not when we're heading into the Q&A portion of the confirmation hearings that we're about to start today. What we heard yesterday, though, was a really good preview, both from Judge Jackson herself, but also from the senators who were sitting on that dais. What we heard from Republicans, I think, is the thing that we're going to really seize on today, the way that they're going to try to piece together her record, some of them trying to paint it as one that's soft on crime, the administration, and the judge herself going to do the the work to rebut that, and we saw some pre-battles of that yesterday, but then also trying to apply their larger strategy of the midterms, trying to paint the Biden administration and Democrats as soft on crime. That kind of fits squarely with what they're trying to do with the judge here. And you can listen, for example, to some of the ways that this manifested yesterday. First, you'll hear from Senator Lindsey Graham talking about the long shadow that was cast by the 2018 Judge Kavanaugh hearings. That's something the Republicans invoked multiple times. And then, of course, you'll hear from Senator Ted Cruz. Take a listen to that. You're the beneficiary of Republican nominees having their lives turned upside down. And it didn't work. So I am hoping that we can have a hearing that's respectful, that's informative, that's challenging. Law after law after law that they can't get through the Democratic process, the Democrats have decided it's much simpler to convince five lawyers in black robes than to try to convince 330 million Americans. So a few things here. One Republican senator yesterday said that they wanted this to be thorough but civil. That's important when you think about the ways that they're hearkening back to the Kavanaugh hearing. At the same time, though, what we saw Judge Jackson do and her validators, really, her friend Lisa Fairfax, and then also Judge Griffith, who were her introducers yesterday in front of the hearing, pre-budding a lot of the criticisms that she might get from Republicans. Griffith himself is a conservative lawyer. And you heard Jackson there yesterday saying that she is someone who believes that she should be limited and she's constrained by the Constitution. Those kinds of pre will hit directly at Republicans who are going to try to paint her as some kind of activist judge or rubber stamp for the administration. That's something we already heard yesterday, but we're definitely going to hear more of that today. Yeah, so Ali, all that lays the groundwork for today. The 22 senators on the Judiciary Committee will each be able to question yeah. Judge Jackson for 30 minutes. And that's just round one. Then there's more after that. So today, which senators are you keeping an eye Don't on? Don't remind me. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, then, and what are the issues you think are going to come up in this first day of questioning? Yeah, it's exactly what we were talking about. Each senator gets 30 minutes today, and then there's another round of questions tomorrow. Look, the goal for the sources that I've spoken to on the committee that's sort of been guiding Jackson through this process is to keep this as low-key as possible. You've seen them repeatedly try to elevate this out of the partisan and into the biographical, into her record, into her qualifications. So far, they have largely been able to do that. The few of the people that I'm watching, though, Josh Hawley is a key person here. He's someone who has tried to make hay over the issue of being soft on crime through the lens of some of her sentencing for child porn offenders. That has been debunked completely by multiple nonpartisan fact checkers, as well as even some conservative prosecutors who have said that they probably would have done the same thing in that situation. Hawley, nevertheless, likely to press that line of questioning. And then, of course, we're also going to hear from other Republicans who want to get a better sense of her judicial view, the way that she decides cases, the way that she has 
thought these things through in the past. She's not going to speak directly to key issues. Judges don't do that. And of course, in the past, they've been asked, but there's precedent for them to say that they're not going to speak to things that will come in front of the court. Nevertheless, today could be a day with fireworks, but largely the goal for Democrats and the nominee is to make it not that way. Important analysis as always. Ali, thank you so much. Let's bring in Olatunde Johnson. She is a professor of law at Columbia. Professor Johnson, good to have you with us. So first, let's start with what happened yesterday. What stood out to you during the opening statements? Yeah, you really felt the history of the moment. And you felt that um, in the introductions and, of course, in her um, opening statement. I was surprised by how moved I was. People talk in abstract terms about things like legitimacy and um, role models. Um, but she was really watching her family and watching her situate herself in the history of her family, the meaning of her name, um, what it, it meant that her parents came from a segregated background, and yet she was someone who was the child of uh, our civil rights, you know, actualization, our American dream. So that really struck me in the opening statements, just the historic significance of the moment made real. And you've touched on this, but Put Judge Jackson's nomination into the U.S. historical context for us and the context of our democracy. Yeah, and I think she did that in a couple of ways. I mean, one, of course, she would be the first black woman on the court, the first woman of color um, at all on the court. There haven't been that many any women at all. Um, and then I just think the history um, that she talked about was the history of our democracy more broadly. I mean, she talked about the Civil Rights Act. She talked about Constance Baker Motley, who was the first black woman judge, um, a lower court judge who had worked um, and argued um, Brown versus Board of Education with Thurgood Marshall. So she really situated herself in that idea of we're now actualizing our American democracy when we have this kind of representation on our court. And I, th I thought that was very profound and beautifully done. Professor Johnson, let's look ahead to today. What are you looking forward to as the questioning gets underway? What are the issues you expect senators, especially some of the Republican senators who may try to challenge the judge? What do you think they're going to focus yes. on? Yes. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, yesterday, I think you saw a preview. I mean, you saw yesterday that Democrats were really emphasizing the breadth of her experience, um, her role as a trial judge for so many times, um, so long, you know, for seven, eight years, um, the fact that she's rarely reversed, um, her broad experience um, in private practice as a public defender, her knowledge of the Constitution, and, of course, that she clerked for Justice Breyer. She brought that up. He's a pragmatic judge. Um, known for his integrity and his civility. And she really cast herself in the mold of that. And I expect those themes about pragmatism to repeat themselves. And then you saw the Republicans. And I think that what they will emphasize are fears about um, how her judicial methodology will be. They talked about liberal constitutionalism. I think they'll talk about crime, which you've already mentioned in your segment which um, you know is not a fair characterization of her overall record, but um, is something I do expect them to ask about. Um, and I also expect them um, to spend a lot of time on the politics. It's hard to say whether I'm looking forward to that, but it's understandable, right? Um, so this is framed within a larger political context in which you're worried about the midterms um, and not just about Katanji Brown-Jackson. So I think you'll see that in play. Well, Professor Johnson, thank you for giving us that large context on a very big day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.